we want to be a church that uses our place wherever that is to actually help. And so alongside of the Esther series we've been looking at, we've had these different conversations going on, haven't we? Around uh, conversations like poverty, uh, Islam, sexuality, and today, euthanasia. Uh, and the reason we're doing that is because these are the topics that get discussed at the, in the staff room. They get discussed on, on talkback radio as you're driving to and from meetings. You, you get home and you get uh, extended family around the dining table and the subject comes up because these are the topics people are talking about. And uh, I've had a few, ask, ask, a few of you ask, you know, why are we talking about this like on a Sunday morning? And the reason is because, well, these, these are the issues of life, aren't they? These are the conversations people are having, and imagine what it would look like for us to be highly well-versed, to, to know what God has to say about this, not just for ourselves, but so that when we're in that staff room, when we're actually, uh, you know, sitting around that dining table, we're actually able to dialogue with people and bring help. We don't want to use our palace to hide, but use our place to help. And so with that in mind, that's why I invited our speaker to come along this morning, Jane Silloway smith uh, she is well-researched in this topic of euthanasia. I heard her speak about this topic last year at an event that Maxim uh, organized and pulled together. I found it really helpful, and I want you to benefit from some of that material as well. Uh, so Jane is uh, well-researched in this field. I'd like to, um, us to give her a big uh, GCC welcome as she comes up the front today. Jane, thank you for, uh, I know it's been a really busy season for you these last couple of weeks. I think what, moving house, uh, changing job, all these different things you've been going through. Young family as well, and you, you've come to help us out uh, around this topic. So thank you. Um, I'd like to pray for you as you begin. Jesus, you're here right among us. And so we would ask that you would uh, help us to think through this topic as we would feel uh, the gravity of this topic in many people's lives. Help us, uh, would you use us to bring help to others in our city and our nation? In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, can we give Jane a big welcome this morning? Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you all for having me here today. And now you're a captive audience, so you have to listen to me for the next little bit. Um, this is my first time at Green Lane, though having worked at Maxim Institute, I know many people who have attended here, who have worked here. Um, so I feel like I know you already. I feel like I know this congregation, even though this is my first time in the actual building. Um, so you, we've got a bit of an imbalance to start off with. I know all about you, and you know nothing about me, besides what Jonathan just told you. So let me tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, I am, of course, you can tell by my accent, American. Um, moved out here about eight years ago with my husband. Um, we said it was two to five years. We promised our families two to five years. Eight years later, um, we own a house, and we have two children who have dual citizenship, um, who ask for morning tea every day, who prefer to go, as they call it, pair feet, um, then wear their shoes and climb trees wherever they can find them. Um, this causes my, grand my mother in the U.S. to like, oh, kids don't climb trees. Um, they do here, Mom. They do here. Um, my husband is the one who moved us out here. He is a, well, he was a research scientist. He's now moved into data science for a movie company. He talks about movies all days and about what data says about moviegoers. He thinks he's really cool and awesome, much cooler than me. Um, he has a PhD in math and I have a PhD in history. Our kids really have no hope of turning out normal. Um, this is them. <laughs> this is what they usually look like. Um, you, can, you can judge about that. Um, besides my family and being American, I've spent the last seven years working at Maxim Institute as a researcher in areas of social justice. Started out in foreign aid, moved on to welfare, and then a few years ago into euthanasia. Um, that's the topic I've, I've been researching for about the past two and a half, three years. Um, I've recently left Maxim and am now the director of something called the Every Life Research Institute, which kind of pulls on all the research I've been doing at Maxim and is um, being a little bit more directed to making sure that every life in our society has value and that every life can be included and in looking at what we can do in terms of legislation and policy to make that happen. Um, but my research on euthanasia is what I'd like to talk to you about today. In the last chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus appears to his disciples following his resurrection. 
There are four of them there. They're in a boat and they're fishing, but they're not having any luck. Suddenly a stranger appears on the shore and says, have you tried the other side of the boat? They toss their nets on that side and, of course, fill the nets, but they don't break. Um, at this moment, they recognize it's Jesus on the shore. It's not just some stranger. And Peter, always the impulsive one, jumps out of the boat and swims to shore. Um, the rest of them come in. They bring the fish. They cook the fish. They have a nice meal with Jesus. And afterwards, Jesus pulls Peter aside, and they have a conversation. If you'd like to follow along, I'm going to now read from the um, Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Now we know that Peter died a pretty horrific death, crucified upside down in Rome for the crime of preaching Christ crucified and resurrected. I doubt any of us here today are too concerned that we will suffer that particular fate, but I'm sure there's more than just a little bit of Jesus' characterization of Peter's end that, we'll worry, that we all worry about. That part about when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. It may not be to a cross in Rome, but it could be to somewhere else that we don't think we'd ever want to be. A cold hospital bed hooked up to lots of machines, a dreary nursing home where we don't remember who we are or who our family is, or trapped in a body that can't do the things we want it to. In Parliament right now, the Health Select Committee has an investigation open into ending one's life in New Zealand. They called for submissions late last year, which closed in early February. And from what I hear, they are still sorting through these. They got thousands and thousands of submissions. I've been reading through some of these submissions as they make them publicly available, and I routinely see this worry about going where you don't want to go, about relying on others, crop up amongst those who want the law to change and for it to be legal to have a doctor assist a patient in committing suicide. Some phrases that I see often in these types of submissions. I'd hate to have to rely on others for basic things like washing and dressing me. It's not a life I want to continue living if I can't do those things that bring me pleasure and meaning. Simple things like taking a walk, eating a fine meal, or being actively involved with family, friends, and my community. I saw my mother, my father, my spouse, my grandparent die a prolonged and painful death. I wouldn't want to go through the same thing or inflict my loved ones to have to watch me go through that like I had to watch. These are all very, very understandable fears. Just over three years ago, I watched my own grandfather die of esophageal cancer. His doctor ceased chemo in June, and he entered hospice care in late September. By October, he was confined to bed, weighed under 50 kgs, could eat and drink only minimal amounts, only to have them come up on him shortly thereafter, and he experienced night terrors. He was on a lot of pain medication, and he would often call out for the end to come. Flying from New Zealand to the US where my grandfather lived, my son and I made it in time to say goodbye. We were there for his last weeks. And we sat with him, my grandmother, my parents, my brothers, my aunts, my cousins, as we tended to him and his final needs. I know firsthand that this pain is real. The fear of this type of death is real. But Jesus tells us repeatedly in the Gospels, don't be afraid. So then what are we to do 
in the face of the realities of pain, suffering, and fear. In the course of my research on euthanasia and assisted suicide, both the international experience as well as people like philosophers, bioethicists, doctors, legal scholars, historians, sociologists, and theologians have, have to say about it, I've come to the conclusion that the legalization of these practices is a completely inappropriate and even dangerous response to the fear, pain, and suffering of our fellow men and women. Before I get into why I've come to this conclusion, I'm going to take a slight detour here and fill in a couple of definitions and context that'll help us as we go. First, some definitions. Assisted suicide involves a doctor prescribing a legal drug to a patient with the intention that the patient takes the drug on their own in order to end their life. It is sometimes referred to as facilitated dying. Euthanasia, by contrast, it differs from assisted suicide in that the doctor administers the lethal drugs rather than the patient taking them themselves. Euthanasia is sometimes referred to as administered dying. The often heard phrase today is assisted dying, and this encompasses both practices. Overseas, 10 jurisdictions have legalized euthanasia and or assisted suicide. Switzerland, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Colombia, the Canadian province of Quebec, and the US states of Oregon, Washington, Vermont, and California. The Canadian federal government is currently debating a regulatory framework for the legalization of euthanasia and assisted suicide across the whole country, which will likely come into law later this year. The path, though, to this legalization is not always clear, and there are many countries that have also defeated bills recently. 25 U.S. states last year defeated bills to legalize assisted suicide, and probably most prominently, the U.K. in September of last year defeated by over 180 votes a bill to legalize assisted suicide in the UK. Currently in New Zealand, both assisted suicide and euthanasia are illegal. Section 63, 164, and 179 of the Crimes Act prohibit anyone from assisting in the suicide of another person. While section 63 and 160 prevent anyone from killing anyone else, even if that person has given their consent to have their life ended. In short, these sections prohibit euthanasia. Parliament passed these laws out of a desire to protect all human life, viewing life as what is called inviolable. That is, it can either be rightfully taken away or even given away. The MP for Epsom currently has a bill on the private member's ballot that would negate these sections of the Crimes Act and make both assisted suicide and euthanasia legal in New Zealand. This bill, if polled and passed, would at the most fundamental level devalue human life. It would put an asterisk beside the life of every person who would fall under its provisions. The terminally ill, those with debilitating diseases, chronic conditions and disabilities, and potentially many others. Saying that their lives have value, not intrinsically because they're human or because they are created by God, but insofar as they themselves and a consenting doctor deem them to have value. This is dangerous because legal norms aren't just things that politicians debate about and lawyers get paid big bucks to help us know and manipulate. They have an impact on culture, on our communities, and on ourselves. The impact of legalizing assisted suicide and euthanasia would be far-reaching and it would be damaging. It would endanger vulnerable people and result in abuse. And it would change us and our culture to the great detriment in particular of the elderly, the disabled, and those at risk of suicide. It would change the way we think of and care for the sick, dying, and disabled. The sick and dying are among the most vulnerable people in our society. Not only are they often physically ailing, but they also often experience high degrees of stress and anxiety, and sometimes even depression. They can also feel undervalued by society getting the subtle message, intended or not, that because they're not economically productive, because they rely on other people, they are a burden and therefore a problem. People who feel this way can be highly susceptible to pressure, both direct and indirect. I want to play for you now a short clip of Dr. Rod McLeod, professor of palliative care at the University of Sydney, 
He's speaking here at an event um, we held last year in September that asked and answered the question, why not? Why not legalize assisted suicide? Recently, the British Geriatric Society published a position paper stating that, quote, they do not accept that legalizing physician-assisted suicide is in the broader interests of society. Older people are often strongly influenced by their families and carers. The vast majority, but not all, will have their well-being at heart. Even so, many requests to end life come from the patient's families and not the older person themselves. It's suggested now that around one in five people choosing euthanasia in the Netherlands act under pressure from their family. One woman I remember very well. She had a family who were all very busy people. This was in Sydney. And they would come in and they would have a conversation with me every day. And I could see that they were impatient. Her mother was take, their mother was taking a long time to die. They said that they wanted to get on, on with their own lives and they told me that she was suffering. But it wasn't the mother who was suffering. Their mother, who was very frail and very weak, really enjoyed uh, meeting up with her children and grandchildren. I'm certain that if they were able to kill her, they would have done so because their lives were so full they wanted to get on with it and their mother was a, a, a bit of a burden. It was their suffering that they were expressing, not, not their mother's. <clears throat> Such families can indirectly or directly pressure the patient to request assisted suicide. Even when surrounded by well-meaning family, patients can get the feeling that they're a burden and that their families would be better if they were dead. Last year, in the U.S. state of Oregon, often held up as the most well-functioning assisted suicide regime, one where there are no problems, just over 48% of people receiving assistance and dying said that they were doing so because they were a burden to family and friends. Also in Oregon, evidence has come to light that patients on Medicaid, which is a state-funded health insurance for those with limited incomes, have received letters telling them that the request for cancer treatments have been turned down, but the state will pay for their assisted suicide if they want it. It's difficult to see how you can make a completely voluntary request for assisted suicide if the state suggests it to you first in a letter. Safeguards built into euthanasia and assisted suicide laws internationally have proven largely ineffective at protecting vulnerable people. Nearly every one of these safeguards, things like doctor sign-off, uh, review committee oversight, assurance that a person has not been coerced and is competent to make the decision to end their life. These are all things that can be and are routinely worked around or disregarded with little to no consequence. In the Netherlands, at least 23% of euthanasia deaths are not even reported to the legislated review committees each year. In the Flanders region of Belgium, only approximately 50% of euthanasia deaths are reported. In their 2015 report, the Oregon Public Health Division, which oversees the operation of the state's death with dignity law, stated that it didn't know what was happening when 74% of the people who died by assisted suicide took their lethal dose. They don't know if the dose was taken voluntarily or what other circumstances there were. And they also reported that in nearly 80% of all assisted suicide deaths last year, they don't know if there were any complications. They don't know if the person regurgitated the medicine. They don't know if the medicine didn't work and someone had to help the patient die in another way. They just don't know what's going on. Additionally, once legalized, the boundaries around euthanasia and assisted suicide tend to creep. The current proposed bill in New Zealand would limit euthanasia and assisted, it's, uh, limit euthanasia and assisted suicide to the terminally ill and those with what it calls grievous and irremediable medical conditions. Quite the mouthful. I have heard from many palliative care doctors that determining when someone is terminal and exactly how much longer they have to live is really more art than science. And if the exact extent of the category of the terminally ill is hard to pin down, that of those with grievous, irremediable 
medical conditions is even harder. We can imagine now that such a category would only include those with degenerative diseases like ALS or motor neuron disease or those with severe physical disabilities. But such a category could also easily include an untreated heart condition or blindness or Alzheimer's or depression. What is more, if you identify inclusion in the category of people who may be legally killed by their doctors as a right, people have the right to die, the right to choose how and when they go, there's no logical reason why you should limit the category to only terminally ill adults and those with serious medical conditions. What about disabled children? What about young adults who feel like no one understands them and life is never going to get better? What about older people who have just become tired of living? What about their rights? We can see this bracket creep in action in the Netherlands and Belgium. Since 2008, deaths from euthanasia have increased by 15% year to year in the Netherlands. Until now, it's reported that 4% of all deaths in the Netherlands each year are from euthanasia. In 2015, more than 5,000 people were euthanized in the Netherlands. Since 2005, the Dutch have also practiced euthanasia on infants, guided by what they call the Groningen Protocol. Not to be outdone, Belgium extended euthanasia to terminally ill children in 2014, despite vocal and impassioned opposition from pediatricians, who said it wasn't necessary, and from church leaders, who said it was morally reprehensible. Among those euthanized or approved for euthanasia in the past few years in Belgium include deaf 45-year-old twins who were going blind, a 44-year-old woman with chronic anorexia nervosa, a 64-year-old woman with chronic depression euthanized without informing her family, and a physically healthy 24-year-old woman who suffered from depression. The Economist magazine actually followed this 24-year-old woman as she met with her doctor a euthanasia doctor who explained what euthanasia was going to be. Well, she had a last meal with her friends the night before the euthanasia was supposed to take place, followed her the morning of her euthanasia, talked to her, had interviewed her that morning. How is she feeling? How is she going to go? She was ready, only to have about an hour before her scheduled euthanasia, she decided not to die. They then pried into her life even more afterwards and asked her, why not? Why didn't she go through with it? What are you going to do now? And she said, I still have the option, just not today maybe tomorrow. Among those euthanized in the past few years in the Netherlands include a 54-year-old woman with personality and eating disorders, a 47-year-old woman with tinnitus or persistent ringing in her ears, and she left behind two teenage children. And most recently and perhaps shockingly, just last week it was reported that a woman in her 20s who had been sexually abused as a child suffered from post-traumatic um, stress disorder because of that abuse and then suffered from depression throughout much of her teens and into her 20s, was euthanized because of that depression, because of that abuse. Professor Theo Bohr, a Dutch former euthanasia advocate and current member of a review committee tasked with overseeing euthanasia requests in the Netherlands, contends that the law change in 2002 sent an unintended message to those who know that life can be very, very hard. And that message is, we can do without you. He sees that that message has been internalized by the culture in the Netherlands, making euthanasia normalized both legally and now culturally. This cultural change is a very real phenomenon. In places where euthanasia and assisted suicide have been legal for at least a decade, we can see a gradual but definite shift in their societies and cultures. The legal affirmation that no one should have to live a life where they are in constant pain where they are reliant on others, or where they are physically and or mentally limited, shifts society's attitudes toward disabled people and to many elderly people who often live these types of lives and find much meaning and value in them. I have a very good friend who is disabled, and every time a news report talks about someone who, oh, I couldn't live if my mental faculties were going, I couldn't live if I was in constant pain, I couldn't live if I had to basically live at a doctor's office. I couldn't live if I couldn't walk. That's his life. He hears that and he says, you shouldn't be living. He sees that as a threat to himself and damaging his place in society. Dutch journalist Gerbert van Lernen had a partner who was disabled following surgery. 
As he cared for his partner, Van Lurnen became increasingly and painfully aware of the harsh way in which his countrymen and women were talking about disability and the disabled. One friend even told him and his partner over dinner that they shouldn't, have com shouldn't complain. They had no right to. His partner could have been euthanized with his disability, and he chose not to. Therefore, he gave up the right to complain. They had their choice, and they made it. In a book he wrote in 2015, researching how Dutch culture reached this point, how their friend could feel comfortable saying this to him, he concluded that a consequence of people being able to speak about their own death and about the question of whether death is in some cases preferable to life is that they may also make the judgment about others that they are better off dead. Once suicide becomes an answer to suffering that society is willing to accept for some people, there is no containing where that message spreads, and this could undermine efforts at suicide prevention. It's not logical to tell one group of people that their lives have value and worth, even if they themselves don't believe it right now, they can't see it right now. And then to tell another group that they can decide whether or not their lives have value, and that they're free to dispose of this life, but it is not what they would like it to be. There's just too much suffering if there is no hope. We rightly worry about the media discussing suicides in too much detail for fear of copycat suicides. What of much of the media's portrayal then of some people's desire for suicide as not only rational, but brave? So if assisted suicide and euthanasia are not the answer to the realities of pain, fear, and suffering, what is? We are to feed the lambs, take care of the sheep, and feed the sheep. It's not enough to know that legalized assisted suicide and euthanasia are not a good idea. We can't just say no. We have to say yes. First, we need to say yes to caring. People with terminal illnesses, chronic conditions, and disabilities can be a bit of a burden. They can require more care than others in society, and tending to this care can be time-consuming, difficult, and perhaps even unpleasant at times. Death would be a much easier response for all involved in some ways. So to take that option off the table means that we better be ready to do the hard yards, be it physically caring for someone, supporting those who are physically caring, or organizations dedicated to caring, or advocating for legislation to increase funding for and coverage of caring options. We also need to say yes to recognizing the blind spots our society and culture and possibly even ourselves have that make euthanasia and assisted suicide seem like a reasonable solution. How do we think and talk about aging and frailty? Is it inevitable? Is it a good thing? Does it have value? Does it have worth? Do people have value? Or are they kind of getting at, they should be out of the way? Something we don't have to think about, something we're a bit of afraid of. How do we think and talk about disability? Do we not think about it? Do we think about it and think, oh, so glad it's not me? Do we see a disabled person as someone who is included in our society and has worth and value, even if they can't do some of the things that we would consider normal parts of life? How do we think and talk about illness and suffering? Is there any point to suffering? Is there anything in illness that we can learn from or gain from? What about the people who suffer it? What's our duty to them? How do we see them in our society? We can all be active agents in creating a culture that truly includes and respects all life, but we have to make the effort and we have to think about it. And finally, we need to say yes to getting our heads around what we think and hope and know about death and dying, life and living. This is really hard. This is so hard. My, my four-year-old son is obsessed with Star Wars and um, in the, the Return of the Jedi, Darth Vader dies. And he's been asking a lot of questions about why Darth Vader dies and where does Darth Vader go and things. And I find even though I deal with these issues all the time, it's hard to talk about. It's really, really hard. But it's so important that we do. And as we think about these things and as we talk about these things, we have to be prepared to live out of these thoughts, this hope, and this knowledge with courage and with compassion. We've got a lot of debates coming up in this country, and we're going to need to know what we think about them, what we need to say. In the analysis of submissions I've been doing to the Health Select Committee, now these are just the ones that are publicly available, so it's not all of them, 
the vast majority of people are actually against legalizing assisted suicide and euthanasia. We have to keep this pressure on Parliament. We also need to be looking at our society and at what messages are we sending already, and then what messages do we want the law to be sending. And finally, remember the four things that Jesus told Peter. Feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. And follow me. Thank you. Jane, thank you for uh, this uh, presentation to, uh, I guess, begin this dialogue. I've, I've jotted a whole bunch of questions down here. I'd like to um, have, I guess, three doctors up here, so including yourself, uh, and then our theologian doctor, uh, resident doctor, Brian Crum, if you can uh, join us up here too, and, um, but also uh, Colin MacArthur, who's also part of our church. Uh, Colin, uh, Colin is a, oh, where am I, a care, intensive care specialist at the Auckland City Hospital also medical advisor for the quality and safety for uh, Auckland District Health Board. So um, the three of you up here, fantastic. I feel, uh, I think we're going to share a little mic here. Uh, can we uh, welcome these other two up here too? <laughs> we, um, we often don't voice a lot of questions here that we have, uh, and maybe the questions we do voice are often worded, I have a friend who, <laughs> but, but this is a, a question that I uh, think comes up uh, in the minds of a lot of people, particularly actually believers, it probably goes something like this, is it really that wrong for someone who wants to take back some control by setting the time and manner of their deaths? I mean, after all, if God is a merciful God, what do you want us to end the suffering of others? I mean, isn't that what euthanasia is about? I just want to comment on that. Um, <clears throat> it is important to end suffering, but as Jane's uh, highlighted, um, this isn't a an absolute right. The things that we might choose to do as individuals can have effects on others. And so we have a responsibility to choose a pathway uh, that is right for all of society. Uh, the relief of suffering can be achieved in many other ways, and uh, the medical care provided by palliative care services uh, can go a very long way towards doing that. And in this debate, we have to see that the choice to uh, allow um, assisted dying um, can have very extreme effects on, on society. There's also the point that um, legalizing euthanasia and assisted suicide doesn't give you full control over your death. A doctor still has to sign off on it, has to agree that you qualify. Um, and of course, there's always going to be restrictions around that because no society wants it completely open for anyone to accept. So there's going to be some element of the doctor's actual control over the death as well. And that the medications don't always necessarily work as intended. It's not always the peaceful, quick death that I think we imagine and that sometimes is popularized um, in media and in entertainment. Sometimes things go wrong, the medication doesn't work, um, and it's not exactly the best death. I understand the sentiment. I understand someone wanting to uh, finish suffering so badly that death seems like a good option. Uh, this is where, in the midst of suffering and pain, we want to continue to speak rightly about who God is. And death is an enemy of God. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about how de death is actually the final enemy to be defeated. And so we have to put that in the mix. Uh, we get reminded by Job that, you know, our life is actually not our own. Um, God numbers the days. He created us. He's the creator. And so the, the, it's that tension, that balance of how do we help people as they suffer? I think that's the key. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. We must walk alongside as we suffer because suffering is lousy. But um, when we do it, euthanasia plays God when it's just not euthanasia's job. It's God's job. So it's that tension. So we fully understand the suffering. We walk with in the suffering, but we remember the non-negotiables of, of who's God and who's not. Colin, you regularly are involved in your clinical work with individuals and families uh, facing, facing death. Um, where does palliative care fit into this whole whole subject. What, what well, do you see happening here? Palliative care 
and caring for the suffering in its, in its broader sense is, is just a vital part of this. In the dying situation, it's important to think what the goals are. Uh, what is it that we want to see? And taking away symptoms is important, but also building relationships, um, doing things that are important at that uh, time of life, and they can be sometimes very, very simple things. If those goals are met, uh, they are sought and they are able to be met, then very, very few people see death as, a, as an option because that actually isn't what they want. They want to relieve the suffering and to enjoy their relationships, to build their relationships in this final part of life. And that's where the focus of palliative care is, is to optimise that part of our life, to make it a good life right to the end. There's obviously a, a you know, huge discussion going on in, in New Zealand around this and you know, some other parts of the world, but it seems to be you know, um, you know, very much of a European discussion Maybe I'm wrong on that. So I'm kind of, why has that been discussed here in New Zealand now? Is there particular things that have been a catalyst for that or fueled that in some way? Love to hear your comments on that. Uh, so actually, um, in the event that I showed you, the clip from Rod McLeod, um, a doctor named Sam Bloor spoke at that one as well, talking about the kind of the culture that we have that brings this question up and makes it a really active and alive question. Um, and the things he pinpointed are individualistic nature, the fact that we consider ourselves to be islands unto ourselves, that we make decisions and they just affect us and then we can just move on. We, our decisions don't Im impact on other people and they don't involve other people. We can make our choice and they can make theirs and we can just, that's the best way for society to operate. We don't see ourselves as interconnected. Um, as well, he sees that we are terrified of disability and of aging. We don't like to think about those things. We try to run from them as much as possible, and we see kind of a perfection of physical and mental abilities as this is just the norm in society, and we kind of whitewash out all of the rest of it and makes us uncomfortable. So the idea that we could ever get into those situations where we would be like that um, terrifies us, and we never necessarily talk to the people who are in those situations and find out what is it actually like? Is it really that scary, or is there a lot of value to be had there? And finally, he sees the, the problem being all the choices that we have. We are just overwhelmed with choices, and they can be paralyzing, all the choices we can and have to make every day. But it also kind of feeds in us this, this sense that we have to make choices. We have to decide things about our lives. Everything, sh I should have a couple of options at least available to me. And we just get the sense that this is just how the world works. And you're right, it is a, it's primarily a Western European Western civilization problem. There's a lot of factors in that, but something that either of you want to add to or highlight yeah, in that. I think in taking the broader uh, picture about what is happening in Western society is part of the driver here. We have been moving steadily away from our Judeo-Christian roots, which has underpinned our law and our ethics, and we can see many aspects of this all, all around us where uh, we're leaving that behind and moving much more to an individualistic uh, approach to the basis for what's or what's what's important. So I think that's just one of many things that is euthanasia is just one of many things that's happening in that direction. Um, I also think it's getting harder to see an alternative. I think isolation is a massive issue uh, as a result of this individualization. And suffering is awful. Suffering by yourself is unbearable. But suffering when you see people that should be suffering with you and they're not, that's horrific. And, you know, we're called to comfort others with the comfort that Christ has given us. And um, this is where we, as Christ followers, we're game changers. We, we change culture by the way we enter into the pain of others willingly. How we sit and pray with and, and sit and be quiet and sit and wonder and sit and get mad at God and scream at God and not know why this is happening. But we don't leave. We don't rush the process. And we do everything we can to comfort and, and advocate for and, and release from pain. But we, we, want, we bear with one another. And we need to continue to show the world another option so that some of these other conversations may not be so strong. Because as Colin was saying earlier, the issue really is helping people suffering more than just let's just end this and get on with life. Colin, in a dialogue uh, we had uh, on email this week, you alluded to you know the um, origin of the word euthanasia, you know, take, coming from you know a couple of Greek words, you for good, thanatosis for death. So this, ironically, this this good death. Um, as a as a follower of Jesus, 
um, obviously you're not encouraging euthanasia, but what does actually good death look like uh, for you? Well, I think it's quite interesting that the word we're using, uh, euthanasia, is actually being turned around a bit. We talk about an early death rather than a good death, and we need to think about what a good death involves. And I th think the keys to that are knowing what your goals are and communicating them, and um, having things that you can that are, are achievable in that in that period, and they relate to, and they can be very simple things, things that involve relationships. The relief of suffering is clearly uh, also a part of that, but it's not the only thing. Uh, there are many things that it is good to have, it, it is tolerable to have some if you can achieve the other goals. They can be balanced against each other, and those are the aspects that bring together uh, a, a good death. In the families that I, I work with in the intensive care unit, that time that they have together as a family and with their loved one is absolutely magic and, and really important uh, for them. And, and we try and make that you know, as good, great an experience as possible. In what can be very traumatic, terrible times, there can be a lot of good that can come out of that dying process and shortening it mm. is not going to help with that. Jane, uh, you mentioned before about the 20-year-old. I think the, there was a news article about this on Monday in the Herald um, that uh, with euthanasia from sexual abuse that she had gone through. Um, just think about laws in New Zealand. I mean, is there a way to, to, to craft a, a really tight law that would really just allow euthanasia in those really painful, messy, you know, situations rather than, you know, obviously a few stories there that starts to become really wide and get fearful of that. But, you know, maybe for these other ones, what, any, any re response to that? Yeah, I mean, this is the kind of the, the missing key, the treasure that all countries um, who want to legalize euthanasia or assisted suicide are looking for is this good law that there are hard cases where you hear the story and you just think, well, I don't even know how to address this. This is clearly what the person wants. Why? couldn't we just make a law for that person and the 10 people like them and then just keep it to that? Um, but the thing is, the law is such a blunt instrument for that type of thing. The law can't be tailored to, we're going to do it for just these types of people. Because there's millions of experiences in New Zealand and the law can't um, foresee all of them or cover all of them. So it must be by its very nature a bit wide and a bit broader than we maybe ideally want. And so a law that protects everyone and only allows it for a very, very small portion has been so far impossible to find. Um, in Canada, I had mentioned that they're drafting a law currently. Their court has forced them to, to draft a law. And, um, and some groups there who oppose euthanasia-assisted suicide have been working with the government to say, okay, well, at least if you're going to pass this law, here's some things you can do to tailor it a little bit more tightly. But the thing is, is even with that, um, there's going to be a few, a few dozen uh, people every year who die without their consent, who die with bad information about their diagnosis or the prognosis of their disease or condition, or who felt like they were a burden or who felt like they were being pressured by family or by the cost of their care or, or other things. And if you're okay with that, if you're okay with a mm, dozen or so people every year dying unnecessarily um, or without their consent, then you can craft a law that limits that. Um, but if you're not okay with that, if even one innocent person dying and one person dying without their true consent worries you, then there's no way. Got back, back to you on this one. Um, the, um, you know, as people watched uh, loved ones suffer, there's often, you know, pain relief prescribed. Uh, and that pain relief seems to have at times a double effect, not just to bring pain, but uh, as I understand it, can actually result in death. What's the difference between that and euthanasia, I guess? Like, uh, where, uh, how does that work? Okay, well, you're talking about the principle of double effect where uh, treatment given to relieve symptoms can have a second effect which can shorten life. The, the most common example is where um, treatment is given for pain um, and the same therapy, which is very good for pain, also depresses breathing. And hence, if you get one effect, the pain relief, you will also have a depression in the breathing, and that can shorten life whilst you're relieving symptoms. Mm. So that's an accepted ethical principle of double effect. You intend relief of suffering, but you get a second effect, which is a natural accompaniment of it that, that can't, can't be avoided. The problem with this, of course, is that it's a, uh, 
a blurry line about exactly how much and the effect that you get. So the key principles are what is the intent, and so separating out symptom relief from causing death, and from getting the dose dosing right so that the, you, the dose is aimed and only goes as far as relief of symptoms and doesn't go any further. That's helpful, thank you. Um, just trying to think of um, you know, how easy it is for us to sit back and um, you know, just think well, society's going down this slippery slope and kind of throw up, throw up our hands and just kind of wail about that. I, we want to be a church that actually wants to positively step in and you know, use our place to help. Um, so trying to think you know, practically, what, is that, what are some ways that we can do that? So there's a political discussion around that of how we can use our place p politically uh, and vote and uh, in different ways we can do that. I'm trying to think now, though, around, you know, the staff table when this topic comes up, around the dining table with extended family. What, what are some, I'd like to hear from all three of you, what are some takeaways for us? You know, with, you know the, we don't know all, the, all this data behind us, all the research. We've had a little taster, but just in that the common elements that we're going to experience with our family and friends who are, who are suffering. Mm. <laughs> um, when I talk about this with, people and friends, and, and I, I remember going through, when I was just in uni, my supervisor, 36 years old, um, died of cancer, and, and walking with her through that whole process, and uh, as we, we were a, sh a small little group of friends and family that she came to her home, and she had a nurse taking care of pain relief, and we sat there with her, and, and through uh, laborious breathing, she would breathe and gas, and we would talk, and at one point, she looked out the door and said, go away. We all look at the door, and there's nobody there. And like, okay, the drugs. And, um, and she goes, no, go away. I'm not ready yet. And so I looked at her, and I said, so you're, you're leaving soon, aren't you? And she said, yeah. And I said, anything you want to talk about? And so for the next four hours, all of us just talked, told stories. She told us the things she wanted us to know about us. We told her how much we love her. And then she just raised her arms up and said, I'm ready. And she died right there. In that discussion, when I tell that story to other people, um, she was supposed to die two months previous to that. And when doctors give very educated guesses to a person's life expectancy, it's a guess. And where there's life, there's hope. And so when I talk with friends around this, we, I talk about, look, we don't really know the days, but where there's life, there's hope. So let's, there's nothing in the Bible that says we're supposed to do absolutely anything we can to keep them alive as long as we can, but we are to be there with them. And we are to comfort and we are to relieve suffering with the knowledge of doctors. And, and so when I sit with these people and say, yeah, but it's the rights, I go, yeah, but life's just too valuable. And I just bring it back to the value of people, that, that we're made in his image. We are worthy. We are masterpieces. We don't actually belong to ourselves. We belong to God. Those conversations, anybody will have those conversations. And so my thing is, let's talk about the value of that person and what does it mean for them to live and die well. Yeah, I found in all of this research and, um, and talking to so many people over the past few years that really at the core of all of this is what makes life valuable. And I go out into society and talk to people about you know, their opinions on it. Usually they don't know what their opinion is, first of all. Um, but then when you start talking about it, it comes down to they don't know where to pin value in life. Do they pin it on their relationships with their family and friends? Do they pin it on their career um, and what they've achieved? Do they pin it on um, what they can give back to society, whether they're involved in volunteer work or in charities or things like this? They're pinning it on something that moves, on something that could change and something that could shift. And I think when I talk to people who pin the value of human life elsewhere, something outside of themselves, and something that never changes, that, that there's, there's so much more stability there and hope um, that life is not only valuable when you can do this or do that or when you have this ability or um, you can give this back to people. It's actually just in you. No matter if you're older or younger, no matter if you're disabled or abled, no matter if you're sick or well, you have value. And that shifts and it looks different for different people in different situations, but it's always there. And I think that's the great thing that Christians can bring to the conversation is that you know that already. You know that you have value. You know that where your value comes from. And to bring that message back out into a society that's forgotten and that's looking for the place to put value. And I think I'm seeing increasingly, especially amongst 
my generation, kind of people in their 20s and 30s, they want to know that again. Um, and they're hungry for it. And so you bring it out there, you in, in bring it into conversation, and it will be accepted, and it will be understood, and it will be a relief to be like, oh, finally, we knew it was something, but this is where it is. I, I think finally the um, other things that we can do is to be advocates uh, for the, the two real issues uh, in going down the legislative route here. Uh, one is that um, personal autonomy carries risks beyond the individual and, and to be able to articulate that, to say we put lots of laws in place to control uh, things that people do individually. You're not allowed to speed on the roads because you might harm someone else. We, we balance these individuals versus society and, and to articulate the, the risk to those that are vulnerable who we have a right to protect in society is a really important part of us working together and, and, and not as individuals. And secondly, to uh, advocate for strong um, palliative care services, that we can actually deal with that worry, that concern about, about the, the loss of uh, functionality or pain or whatever the symptoms are that are the thing you're actually wanting to uh, treat. And we can do that very, really, really well. And I think people underappreciate how well, in nearly all cases, it, it, it can be treated. Final question. Uh, this has really been a catalyst, probably a just beginning of a conversation for, for many here, um, but there's probably still a whole bunch of questions we haven't covered. Uh, where can people get some help? Maybe, Jane, you have some ideas. Brian, you might have some ideas here too. Yeah, so one thing that you can do is um, Renee Joubert from Euthanasia Free New Zealand is out in the, in the lobby area, and she has a sign-up sheet, and she um, sends out a regular newsletter and keeps people up to date with what's going on, especially in New Zealand with the whole the legislation and the House Select Committee and how that's all progressing. Um, so she can keep you up to date on those things if you sign up with her. As well, there are several really great websites and resources out there. Um, Euthanasia Free has some on their website. Family First as well has done a bit of research, uh, contracted research on this topic. Maxim Institute, I wrote a submission there um, that's available on Maxim's website. Um, internationally, there's some great places that have blogs that are really great at kind of tearing apart all the different issues involved in this. Uh, two of my favorites are the uh, Care Not Killing in the UK, which is run by doctors um, and others, and, um, and Living Well, Dying Well, which is a think tank in the UK that looks at that question of what does it mean to live well, what does it look like to die well. So not only do they look at, you know, is euthanasia-assisted suicide a good idea, but also, okay, if so or if not, what else can we be doing? What, how else can we be making this better? What other questions do we need to be asking? So those are great websites to check out. This might sound a little bit wafty, but if, if you want to make a change, you need to be sitting at the table. And I think with legislation issues and, and being aware, um, with my pastor hat on now, uh, my hope and prayer is that we continue to be one another people and we actually do bear with one another and that we don't ignore suffering anymore that we sit in the hospital rooms, we sit with uh, people while they meet with their doctors. By being at that table, we hear the, the complexity of the decisions. We can be praying with, we can be walking alongside, ministry of presence. And it's often from those positions that when you do go seek help, you now know what you're asking for, but let's get rid of the isolation. And it's from that kind of grassroots, all of a sudden new ideas will come up and new conversations will happen because we understand. So my first hope is that what we could do is actually just be present, be there, friends and family, and then watch how God moves us from that. So we don't want to be a church that uh, just you know, places our head in the sand. We, we, we want to engage in these things because Jesus calls us to live in our society as salt and light. Uh, we have family, friends around, there's people, there's colleagues who will be going through many of these issues. We're a church that, as we open God's word, we see the dignity and value of every single person uh, made in the image of God. And so let's be, let's be a group of people that keep promoting that uh, in all of these issues that we're talking about. Uh, Brian, Jane, Colin, thank you for helping uh, guide us through this discussion today. Can we give them a, a big appreciation?